So for the final talk of the weekend, we have R. Ganesh from uh, IMSC, who's going to talk about the quantum spin quadrumer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, organizers, for this nice workshop. It's always very nice to come to ICTS and see all the trees grow after every visit. Uh, hopefully, this will be the beginning of a nice week, not the end of a week, but let's see. So I'll talk about um, the quantum spin quadrumer. So the title I'd given earlier was, in how many ways can four vectors add to zero? So this is just a more prosaic title for the same talk. So this work was done with uh, my student, Shubankar, who is here. He has presented a uh, poster on the same work just outside, and my colleague, Professor Arshankar. So let's get to it. So I'm from the Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Chennai, not very far from here, five hours from here. Good. So um, in frustrated magnetism, we study many typical systems. A lot of them have very common motifs. They're built from um, very popular motifs. So one of those, the fundamental motif, is the fully coupled cluster. So let me just explain what that is. So consider a cluster of n spins, such that every spin is coupled to every other spin with the same antiferromagnetic coupling. Okay? So as an example, you can take this as a trivial example. You have just two spins. Every spin is coupled to every other spin. There is just one bond. So we call this a dimer. Uh, and then we can consider this, uh, a triangle motif, which you know, it's there in a Kagome lattice, for example. You have three spins, and every spin is coupled to every other spin. And because the bond lengths are the same, the coupling amplitude is also the same. It's natural to have the amplitude the same. Then there is a tetrahedron, which makes the pyrochlor lattice, which is four spins, but every spin is again coupled to every other spin with the same bond length, or likewise the same bond amplitude, the same bond strength. Right? So this we call a quadrumer, it has four spins. You can actually build more, go to five, six, but then you need higher dimensions. You will have to go to more than three dimensions to do this. So we will try to study these. In particular, we'll try to study this. That's the goal of this talk. And there's something very interesting, although you might think it's just four spins, it's just a cluster. It has very interesting physics already at the level of four spins. Okay. So uh, in all of these systems, you can write the Hamiltonian like this. The so sum is over every spin. Si and Sj are summed over all spins. And you have a J, an antiferromagnetic coupling. You can write this as J times total sum square. Okay, this is a, an easy thing to check. If you just write this out and square it, you'll see that you'll get constant terms of the form S1 square, S2 square. You can neglect those constants. The remaining terms will be precisely this. Okay, so this Hamiltonian has a very interesting geometric form. And this is what we will use to analyze this. Good. So just to drive home this example, you, you can think of the the dimer, the n is equal to two fully mutually coupled cluster. Uh, and it's very interesting because it's a part of, it, um, it is a motif to build many interesting quantum magnets. For example, it, it builds dimerized magnets, it's even the squared antiferromagnet. If you think of a squared antiferromagnet, you can think of it as being made of these dimers. Similarly, the n is equal to three motif. It is uh, an essential motif for the triangular lattice as well as for the Kagome lattice. So this is a triangular lattice. You can think of it as being made of triangles that are touching. Right? So then each triangle is described by that Hamiltonian. To understand the triangular lattice, you have to understand one triangle first. Okay, so that's the goal. So what we're interested, uh, in, we interested in here is the pyrochlor lattice, for example, which is this tetrahedra as motifs. So n is equal to 4. There are also some other models. There's a checkerboard antiferromagnet, the square lattice, J1, J2 problem. This is a very central uh, building block of that problem. OK. So, so far, n is equal to 2 and 3 are well studied, in the sense that I'll describe now. Okay. They have very good semi-classical descriptions. So some people in the audience have worked on these. Uh, and they, they've been very useful. So far, a semi-classical theory for the n is equal to 4 cluster did not exist. So we have provided that. And we see that this n is equal to 4 cluster is a non-trivial extension from 2 and 3. It's a big step forward. It's very different. Uh, it provides the example of dynamics on a non-manifold space. So I'll, I'll describe that. It also has a very elegant physical description in terms of emergent fields. Uh, there'll be an emergent spin degree of freedom that can depend. I will describe this as we go ahead. Okay. And uh, this can serve as a starting point to describe pyrochlor magnets and other complicated systems. Okay, so that's the outline of the talk. So I'll, I'll try to go through this. Okay, please feel free to interrupt me if there are any questions. So let's first start with the n is equal to 2 problem, a dimer. So I have two spins, 
and the Hamiltonian is simply S1 plus S2 whole square. Okay? So let's think of the problem classically first. I ask classically, how, what is the space uh, on which this problem lives? This problem lives on the configuration space S2 cross S2. The first spin is on a sphere. The length is fixed, but it can be anywhere on the sphere. The second one is also has, lives on a sphere, but the length is fixed. So the, mathematically, there's just S2 direct product S2. Now, how do I find the classical ground state? The ground state condition is simply that the Hamiltonian should be zero. So you notice that the Hamiltonian is actually a square. It cannot be negative. The lowest it can be is zero. So the ground state condition is S1 plus S2, zero. Okay. Uh, so if you, if you think of the full space that is four-dimensional, after you put in this constraint, you see that it's two-dimensional. Okay. And there's a very simple way of seeing this. So imagine I want to have a ground state of the dimer, a classical dimer. I can fix the first spin to point up, and the second spin is opposite. That's a ground state. So total spin is zero. So the Hamiltonian is S1 plus S2 whole square is zero. Now, I could have placed the first spin in any direction, and I can just take the opposite value for S2, and that would be a ground state. Okay. So if I were to describe all possible classical ground states of the dimer problem, that's equivalent to just specifying the first spin. I can put the first spin anywhere, the second spin is automatically opposite, and then I have a classical ground state. Right? So the classical ground, states, ground state space of this dimer problem is S2. It is a sphere. It's just the allowed values of the first spin. The second one gets automatically fixed. Okay? Uh, so that's the classical ground state space. Okay? And it, it forms a manifold. Okay? This is a mathematical word that you might be familiar with. So what this means is this. It means that this space is two-dimensional. In other words, wherever you are, suppose you take, this is one classical ground state, you take this ground state, and you ask, I want to make small deviations from this ground state, but I want to remain within the ground state space. Okay. I, sh I should still remain always in a ground state. If I want to do that, there are only two ways. I have the first spin here. I can pull it this way or that way. So there are two degrees of freedom. There are two dimensions. Okay. So wherever you are on this space, you have two soft modes. You have two degrees of freedom. You can move along two directions such that you remain on a ground state. You remain as a ground state. So the energy is zero. Okay. So the classical ground state space is the two-dimensional manifold. This is precisely the meaning of a manifold. It's two-dimensional everywhere. Wherever, everywhere on the space is two-dimensional. Okay. Now, you can ask um, the low energy dynamics of this cluster. I have a dimer, and I want, say temperature is very low, and I want to ask what is the dynamics of this cluster. And now this simply is it's, it's just described by a unit vector order parameter. Essentially, I have to say the first spin is always pointing in some direction. That's given by a unit vector. That's just the direction. And that unit vector can move with time. That's the d dynamics of this problem. So you can convince yourself, after some work, that this simply maps to a particle constrained to move on the surface of a sphere. You can just imagine the first spin as a particle. It's moving somewhere. You just write the theory for a single particle moving on the surface of a sphere. That describes the low energy dynamics of the timer. Okay. And this describes the semi-classical and the quantum limits. Uh, and this is a very useful way to think about it. So you might think, why should we do this? So it's only two spins, it's very easy. Um, why should I even think of it as a particle moving on a sphere, for instance? Okay. It is a very useful thing to do, because it allows you to construct effective theories for more complicated systems. Okay. Here's an example. The square antiferromagnet is something we're all familiar with. So here's a picture. Now, if you want to describe the low energy dynamics of the square antiferromagnet, uh, the st the, one of the most popular ways to do it is through this which is Haldane's field theory for the square lattice antiferromagnet. Okay. And the way the field theory is constructed is using this. Okay. So what you do is you think of the square lattice like this. You say each, one, each piece is a dimer. And the dimers are coupled by these bonds. Okay. And I say that this dimer is always in its ground state space. Okay. So there is a single unit vector representing the state of this dimer. Then there is one unit vector representing the state of di that dimer, and so on. So now I can think of that as a unit vector field that's slowly varying in space and in time. And that's how you write this, uh, the field theory for the square lattice antiferromagnet. Okay, so these are useful things to do. But you first have to understand the, the dynamics of a single dimer to be able to do this. Okay? So let's move to the next space. Uh, n is equal to 3. So suppose I have three spins. Yes, please. Yes, sir.
Yes. So, the, so what you're imagining is the extreme quantum spin half case. Uh, in that case, it's just the particle is is on the wave function of the particle covers the entire sphere. So that's why it's uniform. It's not uh, moving. This is a largest picture. This is uh, yes, valid for largest. Yeah, but it, you can extend it to small s as well. Okay. So n is equal to three. Uh, I have to say it spins on a triangle. The Hamiltonian is this. Once again, I have three spins. The configuration space is S2 cross S2 cross S2. Naively, that corresponds to six degrees of freedom. And I have a classical ground state condition, which is that the total spin must be zero. And you see it's a vector equation, S1 plus S2 plus S3 is zero. So the X component should be zero, Y component should be, should be zero, and Z component should be zero. So this is actually three equations. So I have six degrees of freedom, sorry, six degrees of freedom, and three equations. So the total number of independent parameters I have is um, three. So six degrees of freedom, three constraints, so you have three spaces. Okay. So what you can argue is that the ground state space of this should be three-dimensional. And there's a very elegant way to imagine why it's three-dimensional. Okay, so let me try to explain that to you. This was, uh, I think, I'm not sure who's the first one to write this, but one of the earliest places I've seen it is by Professor Kawamura, who's here. So the odd, this work is here. Okay, so let's consider ground states of this problem. I have three spins, and the total must be zero. So the way I can do that is I put them on one plane. I put the first spin here, this spin here, that spin there. So this is a 120-degree state. The angle between them is 120 degrees. So clearly, the total sum is zero. Uh, and this is one allowed classical ground state. However, I could have chosen any plane, and I could have put the spins over there. And that would also be a classical ground state. Okay. So how do I write all such states? So there is a simple way to do that. You just take one particular ground state. I'll call that the reference state. And you apply an overall rotation. You rotate the, all the three spins by the same rotation. You can rotate it about any axis by any angle. And that will also give you a ground state. And it will give you actually every ground state. Every ground state can be accessed this way. So the, the precise statement is that the ground state space of this problem is equivalent to SO3, the space of all rotations. You do any rotation, and that will give you a ground state. Okay. So the classical ground state space here is SO3. Now, this is a three-dimensional manifold. Okay. Once again, what that means is you take any particular ground state, and if I say I want to make small changes such that I still, I'm still in a ground state, there are three ways to do that. Okay. So the simple way to imagine it is you take any particular ground state, some plane, you have these three 120-degree spins. Now you can rotate it about the x-axis, y-axis, or z-axis. So the three degrees of freedom, and they're independent. Okay. And that's why it's a three-dimensional uh, manifold. At every point in the space, it's three-dimensional. Okay. The low energy dynamics of this problem uh, is actually described by an SO3 matrix order parameter. It's a rotor. It's a rotation matrix order parameter. So this maps to the dynamics of a rigid body. So if I say I have a rigid body, the center of mass is fixed. The only thing it's allowed to do is to rotate. And this is precisely equivalent to that problem. So you can describe the dynamics using this. This is, once again, very useful. So you can use this to construct a field theory for a triangular lattice antiferromagnet, as was done by Dombre Reed in 1989. Okay. So essentially what you say is, you say that each triangle must be in a ground state. So for this triangle, I can associate one rotation matrix. Then the next triangle, again, I can associate a rotation matrix, and so on. Okay. So I have, uh, at every point in space, coarse grain space, I have a rotation matrix field. And that, that rotation matrix varies smoothly in space and in time. That is how you construct this uh, field theory for a triangular lattice antiferromagnet. All right, so this is all ancient history, for me at least. Yes, please. What is? Oh, so P is a, is a projection operator onto the plane. It has to do with how you choose the reference frame. Uh, so you first define one reference ground state. All other states are rotations of that. So it has to do with that, some detail here. Good. So from 1989, we're going to fast forward to 2000. I think it was 2016, but let's say 2018 for now. Okay. So now let's consider four spins. And I have a cluster of four spins, on a, say spins on a tetrahedron. And I have the Hamiltonian given again by S1 plus S2 plus S3 S plus S4 whole square. Now I want to ask, what is the ground state space of this? In terms of the answer is non-trivial. It's not so easy. Uh, so let me describe this to you. So once again, the configuration space is just four times S2. Each spin has two degrees of freedom. 
So on the whole, I have eight degrees of freedom to represent any state of four spins. Okay. Now I have one condition to determine the ground state, which is that the sum of spins should be zero. But this is a vector equation, so x, y, z components. So it's actually three constraints. Right? So I have eight degrees of freedom and three constraints. You might expect that this should give you a five-dimensional space. Okay. So the space of all ground states should be a five-dimensional space. And by analogy with the previous problems, you might expect that it's a five-dimensional manifold. Okay. So at every point, it's five-dimensional. Turns out it's not true. I'll describe that as we, as we go ahead. Okay. OK, so at least let me first describe some possible way to describe any ground state. Okay. So this requires some imagination, so please bear with me. Uh, so I'm going to claim that any ground state can be described by five parameters in the following way. Okay. So I'll first use two parameters, theta and phi, to fix four spins in a particular way. I'll describe that now. And then I will rotate the whole thing using a rotation matrix. Okay. And a, a rotation matrix in general has three parameters. It has three Euler angles. Okay. Uh, and then you will get one overall, overall configuration of uh, four spins such that the total spin is zero. Okay, that's the problem I want to do. So let's first describe a general state using two angles, theta and phi. Okay. So let me do this in the following way. Let me first assume that all four spins lie in the same plane. Okay. And let me assume that these two spins are opposite. S1 and S3 are opposite to each other. S3, S2 and S4 are opposite to each other. And this angle is 2 theta, or theta here, theta there. Okay. So uh, let me start off with that. I've defined theta by this. Then I'm going to say, so you can already, you can easily see that the sum of spins is zero. So this spin and this spin cancel each other, those two cancel each other. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the two spins in the top, and I'm, they form a plane, and I'm going to rotate the plane. So you see, that's what this brown object does. So those two spins are going to move like this. Now I take the bottom two, and I also twist that plane, but I twist it in the opposite way. Okay. So that's the operation I've done. So this, is, uh, this twist angle is, defines an angle, which we call phi. Okay. So this also, so now the resulting state also has total spin 0. You can see that when I do this twist with S1 and S2, S1 plus S2 is preserved. Similarly, S3 plus S4 is preserved. So again, total spins add to 0. So by these two angles, I've defined some configuration here. But then I can now take this whole thing, and I can rotate it in any way I like that will also have total spin zero. Okay. So this describes uh, a ground state, and, but it turns out that it describes every possible ground state. Okay. So there is no ground state that you cannot get by this method. Okay. You get all possible ground states. So this is a convenient way to parameterize the space with five degrees of freedom, theta phi, and a rotation matrix. Good, OK, so let's go ahead. So this is just a mathematical form of the same thing. So Theta phi represented those two states with that twist, and I've just written that down. Then you apply a rotation angle on it. So there's already some, just a nice point that will turn out to be very elegant later. So it turns out that theta goes from 0 to pi, phi goes from 0 to 2 pi. To avoid double counting, this is how you have to fix it. So you see that this theta phi already looks like spherical coordinates, it looks like a vector. It turns out it'll, it'll become a vector at some point. So let's see. OK, so theta phi are these two parameters. They fix the relative angles between spins. And their allowed ranges resemble that of a unit vector. So naively, we might expect that this theta phi together give me one S2, like one space, it defines one unit vector. And then I have one rotation matrix, which is SO3. So we might naively expect that the ground state space is SO3 direct product S2. Turns out it's not correct, we'll, but we'll come to that. OK, so this is what we're going to do. So we are going to use this. This is a starting point. And we're going to construct a large S path integral description of the quadrumer. Uh, and hopefully, this will be useful for other problems later. Right? OK. So, so there is a standard way to write a path integral for spins. Uh, it's in textbooks in, by now, for instance, in our back. So we are writing a path, we now write the path integral for this four spin system. So the general way to write a path integral is you have a partition, act, partition function, you integrate over all parameters, you have an action. That action has two parts. There is a berry phase part and an energy part. Okay. The berry phase is just a geometric quantity. Um, so you can just think of it as, if you imagine that uh, one spin, uh, so here there's a trace in the, in the partition function. So if you start from here, you have to come back to the same point. 
When you do that, you will enclose an area. So you see how, what area is subtended at the North Pole, and that is precisely the very face. So it has some geometric meaning to it. Okay? So if you haven't seen it, you should see it. So you can. Good. So there's a little bit of tedious detail, so let me try to explain this. OK, so this is how we do the semi-classical action for this. So we parameterize the spin state in the following way. So I have SJ. So J is the spin index. J is 1, 2, 3, 4. We have four spins. So SJ is written like this. So S is just the amplitude. It's the length of the spin. Okay. And then inside here, that's a unit vector. And that unit vector I've written like this. So for a moment, just imagine that L is 0. So this thing does not exist. Just for a moment, imagine that. Okay. So now I have NJ, which is N1, N2, N3, N4. These are the four unit vectors defined by that theta and phi operation. Okay. You define theta, and then you twist the planes, you get four vectors. I'll call that NJ. And now I do an overall rotation that's given by R. So R is the same for every spin. It's a global rotation for every spin. Okay. So if I just have S, that's the length, that's a rotation matrix, those are the unit vectors. Together, these three define every possible ground state as I've just described to you. So ground state is described by theta phi and r, and length is s, so that's precisely this. Okay. So what we have now done is we have added a, a deviation from the ground state. I've introduced the vector l, and what this vector does is it takes you out of the ground state space. Okay, we, we want to allow for small fluctuations, which cost uh, small energy. So, uh, so that is achieved by this object. Okay. Uh, and we need a, a projection operator there. So this is just a projection onto the plane perpendicular nj. You need this just to ensure normalization. So don't worry too much about it. You need it to have a consistent theory. Uh, in a sense, what it means is if I have a unit vector like this and I want to put a, a deviation on top of it, the deviation has to be perpendicular to the spin to preserve normalization, if it's a small deviation. If the deviation is along the spin, the length will change. So that should not be allowed. So the m precisely does that. OK, so we have introduced a new vector parameter L, which is three components. Uh, and this represents deviation from the ground state space. In other words, it induces a magnetization. So the ground state space is total magnetization 0, or sum of spins is 0. So L takes you out of that. It increases the energy and takes you out. Good. So this parameterization is, is reasonable. You can see that, for instance, this way. Uh, the total number of degrees of freedom of the space were eight. So we have four spins. Each spin is given by some theta phi. So each spin has two angles. Four spins is eight angles. So in total, we have um, eight degrees of freedom. Now, the way we have parameterized it, r has three degrees of freedom. The n's are defined by theta and phi. That's two. And then l has three degrees of freedom. So we have three, two, and three. So in total, we have eight degrees of freedom. So we are covering every possible, uh, at least the degree of freedom counting is correct. Okay, so it should, the space is eight-dimensional. We have eight degrees of freedom to do this. Okay, so we now do a low-energy theory. Um, so what we do is this. Uh, we, we will assume that S is much greater than one. So that's just the length of the spin. It's much greater than one. And we'll assume that the deviation from the ground state space is of order one. So the deviation is much smaller than S. So the length of the spin is S, and you make a small deviation from it. Okay, that's the the mathematically rigorous way to do this calculation. So it's done as an expansion in powers of s. Good, OK. So and all spins are normalized to s. Uh, and this, this is, let's just note this. this is going to come up later. So if I now ask, what's the total magnetization of the spins with this parameterization, I just need to add the four spins. Then you can see that the sum of the ni's is 0, sum of the nj's is 0. So then they drop out. We just get sum of these. So that's precisely this quantity. So for now, just think of this. So RML is the net magnetization of the cluster. Okay, you can see that when L is 0, then magnetization becomes 0. Okay, it'll become, it's useful for the next, uh, next slide. Good, OK. So with this parameterization, we try to write the path integral for the system. And it takes a very nice form. Uh, it has two parts, as I described. There's a Berry phase part and the Hamiltonian part, the energy part. So let's first describe the Berry phase. The very phase uh, it can be written as that uh, the sum of areas covered on the block sphere. Um, that is written by this. So after lo lots of tedious manipulations, which Bunker did spent many hours doing, uh, we, it reduces to some simple form. It, in, it induces a few 
So we have to introduce some new notation. So let me just do this now. Uh, okay. So it has. Let me just actually start from here. So this u is zero. So this term actually vanishes. It's just a consequence of uh, the parameterization. We have introduced a new vector v. It's defined like this. So this vector, you see, it has some uh, time one single time derivative of r, which is a rotation matrix. Okay. So this has a very simple geometric meaning. Uh, this vector is simply the angular velocity of a rigid rotor. So imagine you have a body that's just rotating, center of mass is fixed. It has some angular velocity at any given time, and that is precisely this object. It has a single time derivative is made from the rotation matrices made from Rs. Okay. So after a lot of simplifications, the very phase term reduces to just two terms. Okay. It has the first term is S cos theta phi dot, where theta phi were those angles that we introduced. And then here there's another term. So there's an RML. And this is the net magnetization, dot v, and v is a vector, which is the angular velocity of that rigid rotor. So it actually has a very elegant form at the end of it. End of the day. Okay. So that, that was the very phase part, and then there's the energy part in the path integral. The energy part also takes a very simple form. It is just j m l square, where m is a tensor you have to define. But you can see that it's l square. Uh, if L is zero, you're in the ground state, so there's no energy cost. Okay, so it, and L is a vector, so it has to at least scale as L squared. So energy is J M L squared. Okay. So, so there might be some. There's still one one tedious bit that has to be done before we go to a more elegant picture. So we are now writing the path integral for the spins, and we now write it in these new variables, which are theta phi and this alpha beta gamma are uh, Euler angles that define a rotation. So we've we defined this new space, which is theta phi, a rotation matrix, and uh, L, which is a magnetization vector. If we do that, um, yes, and then the, the action takes this form. Okay. okay. If we do that, there is a Jacobian that has to be calculated when you, you're changing variables in the path integrals. You have to calculate the Jacobian, and, and the Jacobian also takes a very elegant form, which is on the next slide. Okay. So let me put it out here. Good. So the Jacobian, which is the measure of the path integral, has, is a product of three terms, okay? and uh, it's it's actually very elegant. So let me quickly describe this to you. So the first part, this part, is or let's let's actually do this part first. It's sine theta d theta d phi. Okay. So that's the first part from the Jacobian and the infinitesimals. This is simply an area element on the un, on the surface of a unit sphere. So in spherical coordinates, you have theta phi. Area element is sine theta d theta d phi. So this is precisely the area element on the surface of a sphere. This first, this part here, where alpha, beta, gamma are something like Euler angles, they describe a rotation matrix. Uh, this part is precisely the volume element in SO3 space. So the sp set of rotation matrices forms a group, is SO3, and it actually it has a metric. It has this uh, volume element, and that's precisely this this quantity. So that appears here. And then this quantity here is ML. So now we, we define a new L prime, which is the net magnetization, uh, which is just RML. And this is simply the, the infinitesimal corresponding to that. DL prime is determinant of M times L. That's precisely what enters. Okay. So if that was a little too much, I apologize. So we can go back and we can just look at the physics of it at this point. Okay. So after doing all of this hard work, the partition function looks like this. And now you can look at it. It's actually a very elegant form. Okay. Uh, so it has three infinitesimals and one action. Let me just describe the infinitesimals to you, because the physics is clear. Uh, so the first part is an infinitesimal, which is like the area. Uh, it's like the area element on a sphere. You have theta phi that a particle is moving on a sphere. And this is the area element that it maps out. The second part is dl prime, where l prime is the magnetization of of this four spin cluster. DR is the, is the rotation matrix. No, it's the rotor's configuration. So if we have a rigid rotor. Imagine this rotor. This is the configuration of that. And that comes here. And there's the action. Sorry. Yeah, the action, as we discussed, has two terms from very phase and one term from the uh, energy. OK, so here comes the nice part. So after doing all this work, you can sit back and try to interpret the results. And it, uh, it has, it, the results are surprising. Okay. So it's the same partition function. I've just grouped it into two terms. So it looks like it's a product of two different path integrals. 
Uh, so the first term we call Z1 is in fact simply the partition function of a free spin. Imagine I have a spin with no magnetic field, no Hamiltonian. It only has a Berry phase term. That's precisely this, and the 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 measure is also that of a free spin. So the first part in the partition function is the partition function of a free spin. Okay, there was no free spin in the problem. It just pops out. Okay, the second part has a, a rotor field. It has a net magnetization. It has an action. So this, in fact, is the partition function that you'd write for a rigid rotor. So imagine a particle that's uh, an object that's rotating, and that's the dynamics of the particle. This is precisely the form of the partition function that you'd get. Okay. So miraculously, this partition function for the tetrahedral cluster becomes a product of two different objects. One of them is just a rigid rotor, and one of them is a free spin. Okay. Uh, okay. Good. So it decouples into two objects. Uh, actually, this is precisely what I've said. Uh, so, okay. So, for so, those of you you may you may have done path integral of a, the path integral quantum mechanics of a particle, you can see that this is analogous to that. So, the rotor is like the position of the particle. So, this is you can think of it as dx. Uh, this is the net angular momentum. You can think of it as dp. So, it's like dp dx. And here you have p x dot, p times velocity, which is what you get in path integral and p squared over 2m. Okay, so, so this is analogous to path integral quantum mechanics of a single particle. Okay, but it's, it is the path integral for a rotor. Okay, so the result after this long discussion is that in the largest semi-classical limit, this quadrumer, we have this four-spin cluster, it maps into an emergent free spin and a rigid rotor. Okay. Just like we said, the three-spin problem, we have three spins, is equivalent to a rotor. The four spin problem is equivalent to a rotor and a free spin. But that free spin is not present in the, in the microscopic description. There's no free spin. It, it is formed from the theta phi variables, and theta phi were those relative angles between the spins. So those relative angles take the form of a free spin. Okay? And that's why we call it emergent, because it's not a spin in the microscopic description, but it emerges as, as a spin like variable. Okay? So, just to convince you that this is correct, um, so let's try to let's try to do it another way, a very simple way. So I have a Hamiltonian of four spins. This is what I started out with. Now I'm starting out with the Hamiltonian. Okay. So how do I find the energy eigenvalues of this this problem? Okay. So this is simply just spin addition. S1 plus S2 plus S3 plus S4 is just S total. So the Hamiltonian is simply S total square, and the Eigenvalues are j into j plus one. It's like s into s plus one for any spin. Okay? Uh, and j can, for add, adding four spins, it can go from zero up to four s. So you see that the energy eigenvalue should be precisely this. You, you do this without doing all of this. You mean you're just adding four spins? It's uh, easy quantum mechanics. Okay? So now, on the basis of this calculation, we claim in the semi-classical limit that this problem is equivalent to a free spin and a rigid rotor. Okay? So what would that Hamiltonian be? It has a free spin and a rigid rotor. The free spin is actually zero. That's why it's free. The Hamil there is no Hamiltonian. Okay. Okay. So this does not contribute to energy. Nevertheless, it, it contributes to degeneracy. We'll discuss that in a bit. The Hamiltonian of a rigid rotor is known. It has been solved. I think it was originally solved by Casimir in his PhD thesis. Uh, and you, the eigenvalues of this problem are precisely j into j plus one. Okay. So you see that you get back the same eigenvalues. You can just think of it as free spin plus rigid rotor, and you get back the, the spectrum of the four quadrumers. Okay. So the eigenvalues match exactly, at least at the low energies, because this thing, for the rigid rotor, you go all the way to infinity. Here, you only go to 4s, but the whole theory is only meant for low energies. You should not look at very high energy excitations. Okay. So, so far, it looks very good, but there is a small catch. So here's the catch. Okay. So. I can ask, what's the ground state of this problem? The ground state energy is zero. Uh, so in the usual way of doing quantum mechanics, just adding spins, you can, it's about, after about two pages of calculating this, you can easily see that just by adding spins, the degeneracy of the ground state is 2s plus 1. Okay? Now, in our picture, we say this is equivalent to a rigid rotor and a free spin. A rigid rotor, turns out, has a non-degenerate ground state. It has a single ground state. But the free spin has 2s plus 1 states. It doesn't contribute to energy, but it can be in any of the states. So the degeneracy of the ground state is also 2s plus 1. So we, the degeneracies match the two ways. Okay. 
Now let's look at the first excited state. First excited state is uh, the energy, if you do it the simple way, adding spins, the energy is 2 into j into h bar square. And the degeneracy, you have to do a little bit of work, but it turns out it's uh, 3 squared into 2s plus 1 minus 9. In our picture, the rotor's first excited state is 3 squared degenerate. The free spin is 2s plus 1. So you get almost this, but not this. You get a, an extra factor of minus. So the correct answer is minus 9. Our calculation misses that factor. Okay. So to large s, to order of s, they match. But there is a subleading correction. Uh, so there is something missing. Okay. So similarly for the higher states as well. So you see that they match, except there is a correction, and so on. So the mapping to a rigid rotor and a free spin is not perfect. There is some something we have swept under the rug. Okay. Uh, so here's one possible thing that we have swept under the rug. And that it turns out it's a very interesting object. So let me just show. Uh, it matches for the n is equal to two problem and n is equal to three problem. Uh, so that's the uh, that's the simple reason. So so I, we could have just said we are happy and we could have stopped. We could have done that too. Yes. But we think there is some deep physics to that. So that's why. So let's see. OK, so here's the problem, or here's what we swept under the rug, what we're not too careful about, is this. So the mapping to the free spin and rigid rotor is not precise, it's not exact, because there is a, a problem. Okay. The problem is this. The mapping fails when there was a projection matrix, the way I defined it. When that matrix becomes singular, this fails. But let's see what that means physically. Okay. So we had written the, the net angular, the net um, polarization, the net magnetization of the cluster was L prime, which is R M L. So you can imagine that if M is the determinant of M is zero, then uh, this transformation is not it doesn't preserve all components. So this has three components. You you expect to have three components, you might get only two because the determinant is zero. Okay? But there's a physical way to think about this. The physical way is this. Okay? Uh, the problem occurs every time you hit a collinear state. Okay? So here, here's one possible state: S1, S2 are up, S3, S4 are down. This is the ground state of the problem. The sum of the spins is zero. Okay. So let, let me say I, I parameterize this ground state. And now I want to add a small deviation to this ground state. Okay. If I want to do that, suppose I want to add a net deviation in this direction, then I can just cant the spins. Uh, I can push the spin down this way, this way. I'll get a net momentum this way. Okay. Similarly, if I want a net magnetization this way, I can cant the spins this way, and I can do that. But there is no way to get net magnetization in this direction. So if I have to have net magnetization this way, I have to change the length of the spins. That is not allowed. So you see that the, we introduced this parameter L, which is said is deviation from the ground state space. So every time you hit a collinear, collinear state, you're only allowed two deviations. You're not allowed the third deviation. That is forbidden by the geometry of this problem. So th this is precisely the problem. This is what we were uh, sweeping under the rug. So every time the ground state is collinear, um, you only have two components of L. So this mapping is not perfect. Um, so there are precisely, and this, there are precisely three collinear states. So you can have S1, S2 up, S3, S4 down, S1, S3 up, S2, S4 down, or S1, S4 up, S2, S3 down. Okay. So there are precisely three collinear states. Of course, they can point in any direction. You have S1, S2 that way, S3, S4 this way. Every time you hit a collinear state, the, the original parameterization we wrote down faces a problem. It cannot go through. Okay, So this actually hints at something deeper. It shows that the, the space is actually a non-manifold. Okay, so let me explain that to you. Actually, let me explain this thing first. Okay, so this is, an, I think, this is a geometry picture that we can all follow. So let's try to get okay, this. So let me take some particular ground state. I have four spins such that the sum is 0. S1, S2, S3, S4, they all add to 0. Now let me ask, how many, how many small deviations can I make such that I'm still in a ground state? Okay, So that's what I've done this picture show. So I have this. I can make three rotations. Okay, For instance, I can rotate the whole thing about x. The total spin will still be 0. I can rotate about y. That will still be 0. I can rotate about z. That will still give me 0. Okay. And I can change the theta variable. So I can push S1, S2 away, S3, S4 away. That's a small, that's also a small deviation that I can do. 
I can change that five variable. I can twist S1, S2, and S3, S4. So there are actually five degrees of freedom. I can change theta, change phi. I can do three separate rotations. So if I take an arbitrary state, in general, I can make five deviations or five small fluctuations that preserve the energy, that keep me within the ground state space. Okay? In other words, there are five soft modes for a generic state. However, when you hit a collinear state, something very interesting happens. I think I'm almost done. Right? When you hit a collinear state, something interesting happens. Um, so let's say the spin said this. That's a ground state. Sum is zero. I can do a rotation about x. I can do a rotation about y. I cannot do a rotation about z. That will just give me back the same state. Okay. And I can, apart from the two rotations, I can do four independent deviations. So I can twist the top two this, in this plane or that plane. Bottom two, I can twist them in this plane or that plane. I can do any combination of these. So there are actually four independent deviations. Okay. So it turns out if you're at a collinear state, there are six soft modes. You can make six deviations that still keep you within the ground state space. So this space is not five-dimensional. Right? So you see there are six tangents at this point. There are six ways to preserve ground state space. Okay? So this is the, the cartoon picture. The ground state space looks like this. Uh, it looks like a figure of eight. Okay? So in these regions, it's five-dimensional. So in most points, it's actually five-dimensional. Except when you hit a collinear state, it becomes six-dimensional. Uh, but that's just an artifact. So it really is the space is bending onto itself, and it's closing onto itself. So the whole thing is not a five-dimensional space because that there is a problematic point. It's not just a point. There are many. There are three such points. Each of them is, has some space. Good. Okay. So, so why did the mapping to the rotor and the free spin work? It was not supposed to work. It works because the collinear states are a very very small set. It's a subset of measure zero. There are only three states. So there are very few points. Most of the time. If you imagine a particle moving on the space, most of the time it spins somewhere here or there. It goes through this very rarely. So to a good approximation, you can neglect this point. Just imagine it's a five-dimensional space, okay, and you get a good uh, spectrum. You, you, you get a good description of the low energy physics of this particle. Okay? So with that, I will, there are just some more small things. I'll stop with that. So what we're trying to do now is we're trying to use this picture to build descriptions of systems such as the pyrochlor lattice. So imagine you have a pyrochlor system. Each tetrahedron, you can now think of as a rotor and a spin. And the next one has a rotor and a spin, and they're all weakly coupled, they're moving slowly. So that's work in progress right now. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks. slide uh, where, where you define the theta and phi angle. Yeah, I think for this slide, um, the, 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 um, um, the proper range for these two parameters wouldn't be from zero to pi or from, I think there is a special case where the four endpoints of the four spins form a tetrahedron, where um, you you would not be able to make, I mean, I mean, for any given configuration, there will be two ways to, to arrive at the same configuration by defining, by, by pairing up the four spins in different ways. So if here you are pairing up S1 and S2 and then define your theta. Yeah. If I do it between S2 and S3, yes. I can define it in a, in a different way. That's true. So right. at the level of classical spins, they're all distinguishable. So if S1, S2 point here, S3, S4 is this way, that's a different state from S1, S3 here and S2, S4 here. Right, but but then yeah. but then um, but then on on top of that, if I am allowed to rotate the whole thing freely, yes. Oh, I see. So you mean the four things are the four spins are completely distinguishable? Completely distinguishable. I see. Yes. Okay. This, okay. Uh, I see. At least in the in the parameterization. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Right. Yes. So th there are some more subtle issues with that, but uh, we we can discuss we can discuss them later too. So I've cheated a little bit when I discuss this, but. Not too bad. I've, nah, nah. So when you go beyond the classical limit yes. uh, to the first order correction in the inverse spin, do you you preserve the goals so the 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 soft mode? So the uh, so we were not able to do it. It's very the complication is very calculated, uh, very complicated. It's very difficult to do it. So what we expect is that this space will become. Um, the symmetries will break. So even before asking if the soft modes will will be preserved. I think it's equivalent to asking that. We can ask, will, 
you know, will, will this still be the ground state space? Right? After all, the symmetry of the problem is only rotations, it's only three dimensional. But I have a five dimensional space. So you have the ground state space is bigger than the space of symmetries. So we expect that it will not be. So it might induce some kind of a potential where uh, these become low energy, those become high energy, and so on. Yes. In principle, that's possible, but we have not done it explicitly. I have a question. Yes, please. Sure. Do you say what a non manifold is? So, um, I, okay, let, um, I'll tell you what a manifold is. Anything that is not that is a non manifold. Right? A manifold is a space where at every point it is locally n dimensional. N can be anything. So, if you think of the surface of a sphere, wherever you sit, it is locally two dimensional. You can only make two small deviations. That's true at every point. So, it's locally always two dimensional. So such a space is a two-dimensional manifold. So this space is not that, because here it's locally five-dimensional, and here it's locally six-dimensional. So it's a non-manifold in this. So the simplest example is just a figure of eight. So imagine two circles touching at a point, forget the dimensions. So then here it would be one-dimensional, because it's a circle. But at that point, it is the dimensions are uh, ill-defined. So you, you don't have two degrees of freedom, neither one degree of freedom. So that's a non-manifold. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks.